Dear students, our next workshop ambulance will be given by Jesse Delin and Tinka Gebruivers. First, they will explain what Ambusé Rescue Team is and how they work. Then, they will be talking about the team behind the urgent ambulance and the non-urgent transport and the required qualifications. Finally, they will simulate a case where they will explain how the ABCDE protocols seems like and um, then it's very important to interact with the paramedics and be sure they will be asking you guys some questions. Yes sir, the floor is yours. Thank you Arda. Good afternoon everybody, my name is Yes. I am an uh, uh, ambulance paramedic in uh, IRT, Ambusé in Weinigem, Antwerp. I've been a paramedic for the past six years and I'm gonna take you on a little Belgian ambulance tour. So first I will explain what our company looks like. So IRT is the largest private ambulance company in uh, Belgium. We have over 350 employees, over 400 volunteers and over 150 vehicles. Our standards are quality, safety and comfort, of course, because we are working with a lot of patients and we perform urgent, non-urgent, international events and uh, custom-made and doctor on-call services uh, within our company. We have 13 emergency bases with 16 uh, emergency ambulances. Uh, they are mostly based in uh, the Antwerp region, but we have uh, ambulances uh, over whole Belgium. Four non-emergency bases with over 73 vehicles, 18 doctor on call bases and one headquarter in uh, Weinigem. We, we transport over 200,000 non-urgent patients every year, 1,800 international repatriations every year, and then multiple tailor-made services, for example, the medical services on Brussels airport uh, and other nice things. So, the emergency ambulance system in Belgium is uh, coordinated by uh, Dispatch Central uh, 112, that's our emergency number. So we provide ambulances for the central, but we don't dispatch them. It's uh, completely out of our uh, league and we don't do that. They are, have basic equipment with them, for example, an AED, uh, bandage, mat uh, materials and, uh, and stuff like that. The basic first aid they can perform. They can be assisted by a MUG vehicle. The, the MUG is the mobile urgency group. It's an emergency paramedic and an emergency doctor who have been trained on pre-hospital situations and they can assist the, the ambulance crew when needed. Um, we usually uh, perform uh, our tasks with two paramedics. Uh, they had a basic training and then um, if needed the MUG will come. But we have a small exception here in Antwerp and that's the PIT. It's a paramedic medical intervention team and they uh, consist of one uh, paramedic and one emergency nurse who can perform smaller tasks such as uh, pain medication, uh, assistance with hypoglycemia and stuff like that. The, the reason behind this is because we have very few MUG vehicles in Antwerp, so the doctor could stay uh, in the hospital or on the really urgent calls and the nurse can perform uh, smaller tasks uh, when needed. The characteristics of our emergency ambulances, you can see the typical Battenburg striping. Since two years there is a new law that uh, states that every emergency ambulance in Belgium has to have the Battenburg striping and the yellow fluorescent color. There is a fixed price per, per transport, so every patient who has been transported or who has been seen by our ambulance crew will pay 60 euros. Uh, that's the complete cost and then our company receives some uh, money from the government as well to perform our tasks. We are equipped with the basics, so uh, an AED, oxygen and stuff like that. We can perform basic uh, tasks, uh, non-invasive. So with ser uh, serious injury, we, we call a MUG. We, as paramedics, cannot give any medication. So with uh, patients who are in too much pain or need anything uh, for, uh, uh, example, uh, nausea, then we have to call a MUG or a PIT to uh, assist us. But usually when we do around 10 transports a day, we have uh, two to three times that we need a MUG or a PIT uh, to assist us. So the MUG, the Mobile Emergency Group, it's an emergency doctor and an emergency nurse. They work in a hospital on an emergency department and when they get a call they come and save us. Uh, 
like pain medication, resuscitation, intubation is all for uh, MUG vehicles. It's uh, invasive procedures and we cannot do them as paramedics in Belgium. Um, uh, they can be automatically dispatched by the emergency dispatching central if needed. Uh, if the caller states that its uh, CPR is being performed, then um, they will send the MUG vehicle automatically. Uh, otherwise, if we are on scene and we say, oh, there is too much pain for the patient, we need some assistance and we can call back up from the MUG as well. The qualifications for the ambulance crew in Belgium. So there is a course provided by a provincial um, education center. There is only one education center per province in Belgium. Um, it's um, 132 class hours, uh, theory and practice combined. And then there are four days of internship on an emergency department as well as MUG and ambulance. If you have a posit positive evalu evaluation, um, you will receive your uh, your diploma and a bl blue badge that you can perform ambulance transports in Belgium. And then uh, it consists of basic training of ABCDE procedure, resuscitation, a lot of training and simulation so we can uh, do our uh, complete best. The non-urgent transport in Belgium is uh, a little bit different than the, the rest, so uh, it's coordinated by our own dispatch central. Uh, we have 73 ambulances in uh, Flanders and uh, Wallonia uh, who perform these transports and it's usually from hospital to hospital, from house to hospital or from a nursing home to a hospital people who can't walk or are not uh, mobile and need medical attention, they can be transported by our uh, ambulances to uh, consultations, etc. Um, they can also perform emergency transports outside of the emergency dispatching central, for example, uh, premature born babies uh, or out of the whole province, province of Antwerp will be transported to the university hospital. In this university hospital, um, the ambulance from the emergency, uh, the emergency ambulance from the university hospital can't do all these transports because then there would be uh, too long of time that uh, the area isn't covered. So we provide vehicles who are uh, specially equipped for these kind of transports. Also transports uh, accompanied by a doctor or emergency nurse if needed. For example, in the Brussels region, we have a permanent vehicle with a uh, nurse and doctor who performs transports if needed. It can be seated supine or in a wheelchair uh, and our vehicles are also uh, provided to perform all the transports if needed. So the characteristics, there is also a Battenburg striping. It's a new law since two years and we're in the uh, phase of changing now. So the Battenburg striping will be only one block instead of two blocks and it will be a white background instead of the yellow fluorescent color. The transports can be demanded through the mutuality uh, by the patient himself or by the hospital. Then they will call us and we will uh, give them uh, an ambulance. They're also equipped with the basics, for example, an AED, oxygen if needed, but the training is situated differently than the emergency ambulance. So the training isn't as uh, wide as an emergency ambulance. The for example, on the photo you can see the neonatal transport uh, care unit. It's uh, a special vehicle who is uh, completely equipped with all the necessary things to uh, transport premature born babies. Uh, also, the international repatriations can be uh, urgent transports wi uh, because sometimes when people, for example, in France uh, have, a, have been resuscitated and they are now intubated, then we will go and uh, get them with our ambulance crew and uh, doctor and paramedic. Um, the qualifications of the non-urgent ambulance have been changed uh, last week. So there is a new law since uh, 2019, which has been, uh, uh, which has gone into effect of uh, starting of last week. So it's a class of 120 hours. So it's only 12 hours less than the emergency ambulance. 
also theoretical and practical courses and they have an internship of five days on the non-urgent ambulance. In the internship they will have to perform a number of patients, for example they will have to do one dialysis transport, they will have to do one oncological transport. If they do not reach their quota they will have to do extra days. After a positive evaluation they are graduated and they will get a visa to be able to perform non-urgent transport and they had a basic training for example uh, vital signs checking resuscitation if needed oxygen therapy etc then we are going to check our ABCDE protocol so we have been uh, changing to the ABCDE protocol uh, four years ago. Before that we used another protocol but the ABCDE is widely spread over the whole world and it has been um, uh, evidence-based medicine that we changed to, do the, to this. So um, it's a step-by-step -step plan so you cannot uh, oversee anything. Uh, if you complete the plan then you have, should have seen everything and you should be ready to uh, transport a patient to the hospital and the most important thing of the ABCDE protocol is treat first what kills first so if you have a patient who has had an accident and his uh, leg is broken but his heart isn't beating then you will perform CPR until his heart beats again and then you can check for uh, for his leg so treat first what kills first that's the most important uh, rule of ambulance in Belgium so the basics <laughs> Uh, just remember the ABCs, it's a nice one, uh, especially in Antwerp on a Friday night. Uh, airway breathing and can you walk to the ambulance? Uh, a lot of uh, intoxicated people, uh, that's uh, uh, yeah, widely spread in Antwerp, so that's why we use this one. So the A stands for airway, but before the A we do something really important. It's uh, checking our own safety and the safety of the patient. For example, if we step in somewhere and it's been a, a drug user, he's unconscious but there are needles everywhere, then we will check if we can take the patient out instead of working in a danger and a dangerous environment. Also people who are aggressive or if the, the roads aren't safe, then we will call in backup from the fire department or uh, the police. We won't bring ourselves into any danger. After that we will do a quick ABC round. The quick ABC round is a ch to check if we need to perform CPR or not. So when we approach our patient we will start talking, uh, we will ask uh, what happened and if the patient starts talking then we can go on to the next ABCDE protocol because then we know that there, the airway is clear, she has a breathing and there is circulation. If the patient does not talk then we will check if there is breathing, if there is no breathing, then we will perform CPR and the ABCDE protocol leaves us. Then we will call him back up from the MUG and uh, we will perform CPR until or deceased or ready to transport. So the first rule of the ABC is the airway. It's um, create a free airway. We can do it by uh, putting in a Gadel tube. Uh, that's a performance that an ambulance crew can perform. We can do uh, intubation, that's for the MUG equipe. Uh, a laryngeal mask is not for the ambulance crew. It can be performed by the doctor or an emergency nurse who has the right qualifications can uh, insert a laryngeal mask as well. Or by position, we can create a free airway. For example, intoxicated persons, we will put them on their side so they can uh, keep breathing and have a, a cleared airway. If the airway is clear, we're gonna check the breathing. How is the patient breathing? Um, it's not only the, the oxygen saturation is important, but also how does he present to us? Is, uh, is, the, is the breathing agonal or paradoxical or anything? Are there any trouble breathing? Because the patient can breathe and maybe have a, a good saturation, but also be clinically not okay, then we will check that as well. Um, we can treat as an ambulance crew by oxygen, or by aerosol. It's a medication and uh, the ambulance crews in Belgium cannot give any medication. The only exception for aerosol is if the ambulance is already on scene and the MUG is on the way, we can give them uh, an aerosol if the MUG doctor approves that we can give the aerosol. If there are any dev deviations in the MUG or in the complete ABCDE protocol, then uh, we will call in backup from the MUG uh, to assist us with anything. 
If the breathing is checked, we will uh, go check the circulation, um, not only the heart frequency and the blood pressure, but also the rhythm. Is uh, uh, are there any heart problems in the past? Is there any uh, retrosternal pain? Uh, things like that. We cannot treat uh, the patient if needed. The most uh, interaction will be with the WUG. They can give any medication to uh, to help the, the heart problem. Uh, the only thing we can do is uh, things like uh, um, position, positionary uh, changes and stuff like that. So if the circulation is checked and it's fine, we go to the D from disability. Uh, with disability, we are uh, mostly going to check the neurological improvement or disapprovement of the patient. For example, the Glasgow Coma Scale is um, frequently used in uh, pre-hospital situations. Also, PEARL, check if the pup pupils are equal and reactive and responsive to light. And then we use the WAPA. It's a Belgian... Um, word it's uh, it stands for a patient who is alert is verbally responsive is only responsive to pain or unresponsive so if the patient is awake and kicking then we will score him an a if the patient is completely unconscious then it will be a u but mostly most frequently used is still the glasgow coma scale because it's uh, you can check the improvement of the patient we will perform a fast test if necessary. The face arm speech time protocol is to check if there is any um, signs of uh, an uh, intracranial bleeding or uh, 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 I don't know how to say in English a stroke. Uh, we will check the glycemia to see if there is a hypo or hyperglycemia. If there are any de deviations in this, then we will also call the call in the MUG to give us uh, assistance with, uh, for example, sugar or uh, or extra assistance. For example, people who has uh, who have a, a Glasgow Coma Scale of three, usually we should call in the MUG, depending on the situation. Is if there is a Glasgow Coma Scale of three after a big car crash, then we will also uh, call in help from the uh, from the MUG. But the person who has been intoxicated by alcohol, we will not call in the MUG because they they won't do anything as well. They cannot perform any extra uh, things than we can. If the disability is checked, we go on to exposure. Um, we go investigate the temperature of the patient, especially in Corona timing, it's uh, uh, an important uh, thing. We will ask for as ample. It's um, a complete check of the patient's history and uh, current situation. So the S stands for situation. What happened? Why did you call the ambulance? The A stands for allergies. Uh, do, does the patient have any allergies to medication or etc.? Because if the if the MUG arrives and they will give any medication, it's important to know. The M stands for medication. Does the patient already take any medication at home and why does he take them? The P stands for past history. Does he have any problems with his heart, with his lungs? What's uh, is there a reason why the the ambulance comes now? And if it's is it uh, possible that it's in the past history as well? Did the patient eat? The, that's the L from last meal. It's important if there uh, are given any sedatives, etc., to perform uh, uh, to uh, prevent um, uh, puking. And then the E stands for uh, event. What's the event that happened that leads to these symptoms? For example, a car crash can be an event, but also uh, an intracranial bleeding can be an event as well, which gives certain symptoms. We go ask for the pain scale as well. This can be a VAS score, so visually with uh, the faces on the, the line, or uh, an RS score with uh, a cipher from 0 to 10. Uh, we perform a head-to-toe uh, complete check. Uh, we're going to check the patient completely. For example, if there has been a car crash and the patient uh, says his uh, leg hurts, we will check him from head-to-toe if there are any other uh, injuries. If this is done and we don't need any extra information, we can also intervene here uh, to do extra things if necessary. Then we will prepare him for the transport. Uh, we can do this in several ways. The patient can get in the ambulance himself. We can uh, put him on our stretcher. We can um, immobilize the, the complete spine if necessary. That's all in uh, prepare for transport. It's uh, when everything else is done and we're sure that the patient can go to the hospital, then we will um, 
start the, the preparations. The Mugarts, if he came, he will always call to the emergency department of the, the hospital of destination. Um, so they are uh, aware that we are coming and they can prepare. For example, every um, serious injury from, uh, example, car crashes or uh, active resuscitations where people are still being resuscitated in the ambulance will go to the university hospital in Antwerp and they have a complete uh, trauma crew who will be ready on arrival. That's the uh, short presentation of the how the ambulance in, uh, in Belgium works. So now we're going to uh, show you how the ambulance in, uh, in Belgium looks like from the inside, what equipment we have uh, with us. And then afterwards, we're going to do a little simulation so we can show you how we work. And then we can interact with you as well to uh, give us any ideas. Okay, and first of all, we're going to take five minutes uh, of break uh, and then we will proceed. So, welcome back, everybody. We're going to show you our uh, emergency ambulance from Belgium right now. So, most important, in our ambulance we have a bed, so we can transport the patients in supine position if necessary. This bed is especially designed to be able to be, be um, uh, put on a special stretcher from the fire department. If we have to uh, evacuate people from higher buildings, etc., they can be put on the bed immediately. We have some uh, different stuff, for example, a special stretcher to pick up patients who are in, uh, on the ground and they need to be picked up on, uh, on our bed. We have two seats for our um, doctor, paramedic, uh, nurses if necessary. So there will only be three people in the back uh, maximum, so two uh, medical personnel and the patient himself. This is a really uh, equipped ambulance. Normally, the normal ambulances in Belgium don't have uh, monitoring or uh, respiration with them. They only have a small monitoring system because, for example, we cannot read uh, ECGs. We only do uh, blood pressure, uh, saturation, and if, if necessary, four leads to uh, check the, the heart rate. Uh, so they are normally not in the ambulance, but this is an emergency uh, international ambulance, so that's why they have it. We have an external uh, AED, uh, because if the AED of the monitor fails, we have an extra one. We have some uh, cabinets with, uh, for example, a manual resusc resuscitator, some um, uh, collar bands uh, and uh, puking bags if necessary. Uh, we have a monitoring and the uh, AD system uh, completed in one, if necessary, a respiration system and a an, uh, suction unit. Every emergency ambulance in Belgium has a suction unit. Uh, the non-urgent transports uh, have a smaller system uh, which can be manually uh, used, but it's not frequently used on non-urgent transports. We have a needle container and some small stuff. Um, a syringe driver. Uh, the MUG always has a few syringe drivers with them. And this ambulance, for example, has one as well, but it's not frequently used uh, pre hospital. We have our basic systems like uh, gloves, extra uh, stuff. We have some blankets with us. And then we have a lot of cabinets who uh, have the basic equipment, for example, uh, wound packaging. Uh, oxygen therapy, wound dressing uh, if necessary. Also since uh, the 2016 attacks in Paris we have a specially designed uh, uh, terror kit which has uh, tourniquets and uh, Israeli bandages etc. We have our uh, personal uh, protection uh, equipment. Since the corona uh, timing we use this uh, a lot. Uh, masks, FFP2 masks and uh, uh, extra gowns if necessary. Also basic equipment like uh, pupil light, uh, glycemia uh, setting and uh, temperature measurement is uh, in this cabinet. Then we have an extra cabinet. Uh, because this is an uh, emergency ambulance we have uh, basic uh, uh, lining equipment to uh, to give uh, med medication if necessary, and then some uh, 
sanitary stuff and extra equipment for the uh, the ambulance for example if our uh, suction unit is full we have some extra stuff intubation uh, but this is not frequently used because the mush always uh, wants to use their own stuff because they know their own stuff better we also have a specially designed uh, bag which contains uh, all the material we need, wound packaging, oxygen therapy, uh, uh, manual resuscitator if necessary, and um, uh, material to uh, take the blood pressure, the saturation, etc. is all inside our bag, so if uh, the patient cannot walk to the ambulance himself, we will take the bag and uh, measure everything that's needed. Out here we have um, oxygen therapy if necessary. These are medically um, uh, purchased, so uh, they can only be used in ambulance and pre-hospital settings and not uh, otherwise. I will take you back to the, the back of the ambulance to show you the, the other side. On this side of the ambulance we have some storing equipment, for example, our fire extinguisher. We hopefully, do, hopefully don't use it. It's not uh, to extinguish fires, but it's necessary if our own car is on fire, we use it. We have some extra oxygen for the ambulance itself. Uh, and then we have a carrying chair. For example, people who are on the second floor of a building and they need to be evacuated and cannot be, uh, uh, they cannot walk themselves, then we will take them on our carrying chair and uh, put them down the stairs. Uh, spinal immobilization, uh, it's, uh, it has been frequently used in the past, but now, uh, since a few years, there are, have been uh, votings to uh, quit with the spinal immobilization and put them on our other stretcher with uh, the head blocks and just tape them. There has been a, med a study from the University Hospital in Antwerp and some, uh, some other studies in uh, the United States uh, who have been saying that this is not the right equipment uh, for spinal immobilization. We have some uh, extra immobilization for uh, possible fractures uh, and then uh, immobilization for the spine if a, pe a person is uh, trapped inside a car then we can evacuate him with this uh, extra immobilization without damaging the, the spine extra. Then I will uh, show you the front of our ambulance. This is a basic front, so we have a GPS. The, the central dispatches the location of the intervention automatically to the GPS, so we only have to get in and leave. And then we have a tablet for the non-urgent transports. They uh, get their, um, their transports through to the tablet and then uh, they can leave and they can also update the dispatching central where they are and uh, if they're with the patient, on route to the patient. Um, they also have uh, normally a walkie-talkie we can talk to the dispatching with, but this ambulance is not equipped because it uh, usually uh, does the international transport, so we don't use it on the emergency central. So that's uh, how a Belgian ambulance looks like uh, in short. Uh, we can also, if necessary, put extra equipment in, for example, a special mattress if the patient has, uh, has uh, decubitus, etc. Um, it can also be modified uh, by the wishes of the client. For example, our Brussels airport rescue team has a special vehicle with special equipment because the ambulance from the airport uses a different equipment than, uh, than other ambulances. So uh, it's... Uh, we, we also discuss it always with the, the patient and with the client if necessary. So now we're gonna take a short break of five minutes again and then we're gonna show you how we work uh, as a team to uh, help a patient out. by a car and we will uh, show you how we work as a team now so first of all we have the ABCDE protocol but safety first so that's why we take our gowns and also check if the, there is no other um, 
transport on the road, etc. So my colleague, the first thing she will do is a manual stabilization of the neck because the patient has been hit by a car. We don't really know what the problem is yet, so this is why we will uh, first check this. She's awake, she's crying, so the first ABC is okay. She has a circulation, she has a breathing, the airway is clear because she's crying. So first thing we will do is check if we need to keep the manual stabilization of the neck. Miss, I'm Jesse, I'm from the ambulance. How are you feeling? My, my arm hurts. Okay, the left or the right arm? The, the right. Okay, do you have any pain elsewhere? Uh, no, it's just my arm. Okay. Does your neck hurt? No. Okay, do you feel your legs? Yes. Okay, can my you wiggle arm. your toes for me? Okay. Yeah, it's okay, my arm. So, there is no neck or back pain. The toes and the arms are both mobile, so we don't suspect a spinal injury right now. So that's why my colleague can leave the, the neck as it is. And then we're going to see the ABCDE protocol. So A, she has a cleared airway. She's awake, she's conscious, so she can clear her airway herself. And then we're going to check for the breathing. So we have a monitoring system right now. We can use it. Check for a separation, ah. and then my colleague is gonna check for a breathing. She's gonna put her two arms on the chest of the patient to check if there is a, an agonal breathing, or normal breathing, or anything different. Ah. Miss, we're gonna do a little checks, a few checks, and then we're gonna check your arm. Ah. Ah. <laughs> Okay, try to breathe in slowly, okay? Try to keep calm. Was that the car? Okay, so right now we're seeing she's breathing normally, maybe a little hyperventilation, but that's okay because if she's been hit by a car, it's normal. A good saturation, uh, and then we can move on. So the breathing is okay. Then we're gonna check the circulation. We're gonna go with our uh, heart frequency of the monitoring system, but also we feel. Ah! <laughs> this is the painful arm. arm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so we also check the painful arm to check if there is any perfusion to the to the limbs, because if she broke her arm here, there is a possible rupture of any uh, uh, blood vessels. So we also check the, the good arm and then the bad arm, uh, the bad arm and the good arm. So we can feel her pulse, it's normal, it's regular, uh, and she will probably have a good blood pressure because I can feel it here, but we also check it always. Blood pressure management always on the good arm. And also my head hurts a bit. Your head hurts a little bit? Okay, we're gonna check in a minute. Okay. Uh. Do you have any heart problems? No. No? Okay, perfect. In the meantime, we can complete the C and we can go on to the D. This is the most important in this case. She has a good Glasgow coma scale, we can see. But the pain scale, etc., is, uh, is important in this case to see if we need assistance from a MUG or we can do it on ourselves. Okay. So, how much pain do you have on a scale from 0 to 10? Uh, 6. Six, okay. Usually we see more than eight or more than seven is a mug and less than seven is uh, we can do it on our own. But it's also the clinical uh, image of the patient. Right now she has a possible fractured arm. We can do it ourselves. We don't need the doctor to come here to check it out. Okay, so the D. Also we are checking a glycemia but we don't do it always because in this case there is no internal affair there is no problem the the problem is clear that the arm is broken or uh, severely damaged and there will be no uh, right sign uh, problem with the uh, glycemia we also asked uh, did you eat anything uh, yes in the morning i ate breakfast you ate breakfast okay uh, are you a diabetic uh, no. no diabetes okay if that's if she's not a diabetic and she ate well then we will not perform the the glycemia measurement then uh, everything neurologically seems fine right now and then we're gonna go on to the e from exposure so temperature management is really crucial right now in corona timing so we will take her temperature 
and then we're gonna do a, a head to toe uh, uh, checking. Oh, Okay, so my colleague is going to measure the temperature. Oh. In that, that oh. Oh. And in the meantime, I can do my uh, assessment of the patient. So, ma'am, how are you feeling right now? Only my arm hurts. Your arm hurts, okay. So, so a pain much. scale of six is still. Uh... Uh, yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you have any allergies? Uh, only for uh, penicillin. Penicillin. Okay, perfect. Do you take any medication at home or on a regular basis? Uh, no. No? no. Okay. Sometimes uh, paracetamol, but... But not on a regular basis. Uh, okay, perfect. Uh, do you have any past history of medical problems? No. No heart problems, lung problems? No. Okay. Any no. surgeries on your arm? Uh, no, no, no. Okay, perfect. You ate uh, breakfast? What did you eat for breakfast? Um, I drank coffee and I ate and ate, yeah and I ate pancakes. Pancakes, and okay. And then the you have been hit by a car now. Yes. And how fast were you bicycling? Do you have um, any idea? Not so fast. It was like uh, ten kilometers. And do you have an idea how uh, how fast the car was driving? Yeah, it it seems like. It was um, like yeah, 40 kilometers. Okay. Normally, you, you yeah, I don't know. It was like 40 kilometers. It seems very fast. Okay. And, and you always have gained consciousness. You haven't been unconscious. Uh, no. Okay. No. And you know, no. you know what happened with the car accident. There is no blurry image. Uh, no. Just my head hurts a bit, but. Okay. You're not nauseous. No vomiting. Okay. I'm gonna check your eyes for a second. Look up. Okay. We always check the pupils uh, to see if there is any neurolo neurological problem. So uh, dilated pupils or uh, unequal pu pupils can uh, give a sign for neurological problems. So my colleague is going to perform a head to toe trans um, uh, check to see if there is uh, any problem besides from the arm. Adrenaline in such situations can uh, can give a situation where uh, we as an ambulance crew miss some certain things. So she's gonna touch everywhere and she will say it. if there uh, if you have any pain then you will uh, have to and say it. Scream. Always check the belly to see if there is a possible internal bleeding. Okay we're not gonna check the arm right now because we know that the arm is already uh, compromised and then we also check everything completely. If this has been checked then we can uh, move on to our uh, last thing and that's preparation for transport. Since she has a possible broken uh, uh, wrist, because it's the wrist that hurts I think. Yeah? Yes. Okay, then we will immobilize the wrist uh, with our vacuum uh, oh. system. <laughs> oh. Oh. This is a special system we use for wrists. We have different sizes of the vacuum systems. <sighs> Since the patient is stable, we don't need a continuous monitoring of the vital signs. It's okay. Uh, Can you lay your arm down? Yeah, I will try. Uh, okay. okay, we're gonna put a little pressure on the arm so we can, if there is a fracture, Separate, uh, separate it from, uh, from the, the bone fragments. My colleague is going to keep the pressure on the, uh, on the arm right now. <laughs> and then we're gonna close it. When we close the, 
the vacuum spell, it will uh, be less painful because you can't move your arm anymore. Okay, okay, okay thanks. Uh. Always be sure that you can still see the fingers if there uh, should be any problem and they become blue or uh, things like that, then we can check. Uh, but they should always be visible. So this is our vacuum pump, we close the vent, okay so now you can feel it press a little bit, okay. and when I pull the, the vacuum, I pull the air out, my colleague is going to slowly release the hand of the patient and pull her hands out as well. So now it's approximately halfway there, we're gonna form it around the arm. Pull the strings again. And then we're com going to completely suck all the air out. Is it less painful now? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, perfect. Much better. You can move your arm now, it's no problem. And then you can try to put it on your belly and support it with your good arm. Okay. okay. I'm gonna help you. Okay. Then we're gonna put the patient up and see how her reaction is. When we put up a patient like this, she has been down for approximately 15 minutes at least. We also check the blood pressure again. If we have a, a radial pulse which is uh, good and we can feel it, then we, we know that her blood pressure is high enough to put her up and walk into the ambulance. If the patient in this case couldn't be walking anymore because she has a, a broken leg or uh, things like that, then we take our stretcher. We transport her to the hospital where she has a, an x-ray, some pain medication, and then we'll see if there is any surgery needed. But that's the doctor's case. Okay? okay thank Super. You. We thank you for your uh, attention and we hope you have a, a nice idea how the ambulance in Antwerp and uh, in complete Belgium works now and uh, hopefully uh, we see you again for the next uh, workshop. Thank you very much for the good help. <laughs>maar ze hebben de stream normaal gezien al afgezet. Zo. Zo werkt het ook niet. Zal ik dan een Ja. All right, the students have now the possibility to ask some questions. I'm, I'm now going to read some questions to, uh, for Jesse. Okay, so the first question is, what are you giving by a a my aerosols? Uh, usually we give uh, medication like Vintolin or uh, Duovint uh, by uh, aerosol. It's a combination preparation of uh, anticholinergicum and beta mimeticum to, uh, to increase the, the airflow and the oxygen support in, uh, in the lungs. Right, thank you. The second question. In the Netherlands we have special ambulances in which surgeons remove donor organs from a diseased patient. How is that arranged in Belgium? We do not have special ambulances, but every hospital who has a, a possible um, donor or a patient, we call them the, the harvesting patients, they will um, call their own surgeon in the hospital and they will perform, perform the, the surgery themselves and they will be transported in special uh, vehicles, uh, some motorcycles and some uh, specially designed cars to uh, transport uh, the organs to the necessary hospitals and the necessary patients. Okay, thank you. The third question, how is a patient with hypoglycemia managed? Uh, hypoglycemia, it depends on the patient. If the patient is uh, awake and he is known with uh, diabetes and we see uh, uh, lowered uh, glycemia, then we can give him um, a cola and sugar. Uh, for example, uh, we, we give spe uh, s uh, fast sugars like uh, Coca-Cola or anything like that. Uh, usually Fanta works better because there is more uh, sugar. Um, 
otherwise uh, we we make them a sandwich uh, with uh, uh, some uh, we uh, stuff uh, Shoko, for example, um, which works uh, on a longer period, and then they will check them themselves. If this is not possible and the patient is unconscious, then we will call a, a MUG service or a PIT, and they will come and give uh, glucose by uh, uh, intravenous axis. And then uh, the, when the patient awakes, we also give them a, a sandwich with uh, Shoko or anything. Okay, that's fine. Then the fourth question. There are people that would give a nine on the pain scale while only having a broken wrist because pain is relative. Do you acknowledge that or do you always call the MUG, MUG when the pain scale is that high? It, uh, it always depends on the situation. In the case we just presented with uh, Varda, uh, her broken wrist, if she would have answered a 10, I would have probably not acknowledged uh, and not have called the MUG because um, giving pain medication and uh, taking a MUG away from its service for this is uh, quite expensive at first and quite uh, difficult because other patients cannot receive the MUG when they really need them and not for the pain medication. So it always depends on the situation and the patient, but in this case I wouldn't have. I don't always acknowledge a higher pain scale. Okay, that's fine. Then the next question. All right. In the case of calamity or natural disaster, what role does the does the embassy rescue team play? How does it help to how does it help to mitigate the loss of life and does it operate any rescue mis mission? It uh, also depends on the situation. For example, uh, we have uh, Ambusay is not the only uh, firm who performs emergency transports. For example, the fire department in Belgium does a lot and other private uh, companies do as well. So when there is, uh, for example, an, uh, a disaster in Antwerp, uh, we have uh, Tsportpalais, uh, for example. If there is an explosion in uh, Tsportpalais, it's a, a large uh, theater with over 30,000 places, then uh, the the first help would be 10 emergency ambulances and they will be um, from every firm it will not only be ambusé but also the fire department the most uh, nearby ambulances will be handpicked by the emergency central um, so if it's an ambusé ambulance of course we will respond um, and extra to those 10 ambulances and five uh, MUG services uh, they will um, call in help from the red cross the red cross has an um, uh, in Belgium, a system designed for uh, uh, large disasters and uh, first uh, help. They will come with uh, all the necessary ambulances. In a large uh, case, for example, if the Sport Palace with 30,000 people would explode, um, then there will be also 10 ambulances from the nearby provinces, from uh, Limburg, Brussels, and uh, uh, Ost Vlaanderen, will send some ambulances as well. And then Ambusé will call to the, uh, the emergency dispatching central. Uh, we had explosions in Zaventem a few years ago and that uh, the, the ambulances from Brussels would do the first aid. Um, and then there would uh, there have been some uh, extra ambulances sent from Antwerp from the emergency systems and Ambusé called in uh, the, the emergency central and said, oh, OK, we have five extra ambulances we can make free we will give them to you and you can use them. In other cases, for example, the tsunami in Thailand a few, uh, I think more 10 or 11 years ago, um, Ambusé will provide, if necessary, medical services. For example, our uh, CEO, our big boss, uh, Jan Christian, went with the medical team to help out uh, and do a humanitarian uh, mission. Um, and if requested, we can always uh, help out. It's usually we have in Belgium a BFAS team, which uh, Ambusé Rescue Team isn't uh, part of. But if necessary, with really large uh, calamities, we can always help. All right. Thank you for your good explanation about that. Um, then the next question. When the patient just hurts his or her head, how do we manage that? What are the things we have to do when the patient is alert and awake? And what do we do when the patient is not awake? 
When a patient is not awake um, and he hurt his head, it's always a MUG uh, indication. Uh, unconscious patients are actually always a MUG indication. But we have to use our common sense if it's uh, in a, a nightclub and it's just unconscious because he drank too much, then we will not call the MUG and we will do it on our own. But an unconscious patient who uh, hit her head uh, is definitely a MUG indication because there might be a neurological problem. If the patient is awake, um, it depends depends on the situation. Um, we always ask for signs of uh, a commotio, for example, nausea, photophobia, uh, vomiting, uh, and more specific explosive vomiting. Um, and it, al it always depends on the situation. How hard did she hit her head? Did she hit her head because she, she stumbled on the normal ground? Or did she fell from a, 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 a chair or a, a table or anything? Always depending on the situation. Okay. Uh, ba -ba -bum. All right. Then, how does the embassy rescue team deal with medical, le medical legal aspects of an emergency case? Um, an example: a road, road traffic accident. We, as uh, paramedics, have a uh, uh, medical uh, in our medical profession. It's in in every country, I think, uh, a medical secrecy, which we cannot uh, violate. For example, if we have a car crash and. Um, one person appears to be drunk, it's not our task to call for the police. Uh, we have a medical secrecy. The only case in which we can call the police is when the patient um, is threatening to hurt himself or is threatening to hurt other people. If, if the, pre the patient states, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plant a bomb in the University of Antwerp, then w of course we can call the police, but in other uh, minor uh, cases it's not our deal. For the example of the road traffic accident, every accident um, in which an ambulance is uh, requested because of a patient who is uh, injured, there will always be police uh, on scene. And if one of the patients asks for police, we can always request them, but we cannot request them because we have hunches of um, uh, uh, intoxication or anything. Uh, for example, we had a burglar uh, yesterday on our emergency department and we cannot call the um, the police because we know he was a burglar mm. we have to treat the medical aspect and that's it if the if there is another uh, person there who says oh he's been burglaring in my uh, house then it's his responsibility to call the cops okay thanks then the last question in my in my country tetanus injection is given to every injured injured person involved in an accident does this happen in belgium too it only happens when the patient isn't sure about his vaccination or if he isn't uh, if he doesn't uh, if he doesn't, he doesn't really know uh, like uh, yeah maybe I had it, but I don't really know for sure of when he's sure that it's been longer than 10 years. If he's sure, for, okay, I had it last year, then we don't give it. If he's not sure uh, th there is a possibility of doubt, then we give the, the injection. All right. Thank you very much, yes, sir. Um, if there are any questions, then, is, uh, then yeah, it's now the moment to ask them. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, okay. Okay, then uh, this was the workshop um, ambulance. I will, uh, yeah, special thanks to the two paramedics, Jesse Delin and Tinka Hebrewers, for the good presentation and, um, yeah, for the simulation. So thank you very much. And, yeah, have a nice day. Thank you.